never been lost. So they don't know what it is to be redeemed. But I, I'm glad that He loved us enough that He redeemed us while we were yet sinners. For those of you that are visiting with us today, you'll need to indulge with us for a few moments. There's certain things that we need to do when we uh, finish a camp. Uh, last night, uh, Brother Billy Paul was here and he answered the questions of the young people. And you're not going to get left out on it because it was videotaped and taped and you'll be able to hear those things or see it in the future. But the young people themselves, they it was their night and Brother Billy Paul was gracious enough to come and, and provide that and the burden. And I appreciate the inspiration of the answers last night that came. And then afterwards we had some refreshments for them up at the Pine Lodge where most of them were let's say, keeping their luggage. I'm not going to say sleeping because there wasn't much of that went on this week. <laughs> and there were those of us last night that uh, had the privilege to attend this camp, but we got to stay in private cabins somewhere else. And they recognized us last night and gave us some very lovely gifts. But today we wanted to give the young people themselves an opportunity to recognize those who survived the dorm life with them. And uh, I guess it's always a, a choice of whether you're going, who you're going to get to do that, but it was decided that uh, Daryl Ingus would come this morning to handle that, and that's what Daryl gets for being a leader among the kids. So, Brother Daryl, if you'd come this morning, and we'll give you an opportunity to do this from your heart and for the benefit of the rest of the young people. Good morning. I'd like to have the following people stand up a minute. Brother Floyd, Brother Perry, Brother Billy Paul, Brother Jim, Sister Mary, and Mike and Kim, and Tim and Randy, and Tina and Richard, and Dennis McGarry, and Penny Hawks, the Dones, to Darlene, and Rebecca Sawyer. Chris Neal and Vaughn. I know we thanked most of everybody last night and I think everybody had a pretty good time. Thank you for putting up with us and I hope to see you next year. Hey. I would like to see them have one without us one time. Uh, maybe maybe sometime they should give us a camp. There you go. <laughs> and they should set the rules. Why, why don't you young people give us older folks a camp and you make the rules for us. Tell us what we have to do. We have to stay up till one o'clock in the morning or you don't have to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, it's a rule. You cannot go to bed. I'm sorry, I'm afraid we'd go to sleep on this sit at the breakfast table or something. But I often had heard it said that if you want to feel young, be around the young people. But if you want to feel your age, try to keep up with them. And uh, I, I will have to make a confession. I've been involved in youth camps ever since I can remember of us being Christians and serving the Lord. Even before we knew the knowledge of the message, we were involved in youth camps down in Louisiana and Texas. And mother and the family and all of us have been and the last one that we had was 1966 and we all went from Tucson all the way down to the camp in Louisiana but then we had them up on the Boy Scout campgrounds in Tucson for a number of years but uh, I think uh, there comes a time maybe when you just get a little bit old for it you you begin to things begin to change about it you want to see everybody have fun but it gets to be too much of a gap somewhere that uh, so, so you need to pray for me. I think I'm getting to the point to where uh, I, I, I'm praying for somebody else younger to come along and it's a little closer to your generation with it all. Now, I'm for them. Don't get me wrong. I'm for them. But uh, for me, my patience is a little thin. Uh, maybe i got too many grandkids or something. I used to couldn't understand why an old person would like to go and sit in a room by themselves and rock in a rocking chair. But ask me now. <laughs> uh, it's a great joy to just get to go in a room and shut the door 
and just sit there for a moment. Anybody my age back there that knows what I'm going about, I'm not all by myself then. We're going to have some special singing this morning that we could have the trio come from the Flagstaff Tabernacle, Brother Vaughn, Sister Mary, and Sister Diane. These folks have been singing together since last year, and they even have a tape and an album, uh, or tape, uh, cassette tape that's available. And uh, I'm sure it's available if you'd ask one of them for it also. They've been a real blessing to the Bride of Jesus Christ wherever they've sung. And I'd, I'd say as one that uh, gets an opportunity to, to hear the special singers of this message throughout the world, God did give us some singing talent yes. Yes. in this message. And yes. I've often said to a lot of people that I don't know of any other age in history where the songs were written about their age right. as often as they have been written about ours already. And I'm not ashamed to sing those about the message nor the messenger in this day.
there was a group of the young people got together under Brother Vaughn's leadership here at camp and formed a choir. And we're going to ask them to come right now and prepare to sing for you what was their theme song and the theme of this camp. You know, all of the things that happened at camp, it's times like this when you see the final product. Yes. yes. I often think of when God told David and Solomon to build the temple in Jerusalem. What a mighty structure that was at that time that he told them not to uh, let the, so the sound of any tools be heard on the temple side of erection. And I can imagine the holy awe that there was when yes. those massive stones were moved into place of that temple on top of the Temple Mount in Solomon's day. But if you'd have gone to the quarry, or you'd gone to the forest where they were cutting down the cedars in Lebanon, you'd have been to the dock where they were unloading these things, or where the uh, silversmith and goldsmith were forming the estimates, there'd have been an awful lot of hammering and noise. But what a holy awe there was. And so I think that's a type of what we see today. There was a lot going on at camp, but listen to this holy awe now as these young people sing in unison and in harmony and let the presence of the Lord come be with you. Stand alone in this message. 
It wasn't done in a closet. It wasn't done in secret. There's literally thousands around the world that believe what you and I believe, that God truly kept His Word and visited us in this generation with a mighty prophet. As I look at these young people every time that we were able to gather with them, I realize how blessed that I was as a teenager at age 16 to first have seen God's prophet. And to have had it affect my life when I saw him in Houston, Texas and realized that Jesus Christ was indeed the same yesterday, today, and forever. My desire always is, is that there is no way that I can, that I can do what God did for me through the life and ministry of Brother Branham. But I do want to be a faithful witness and continually tell people that I believe that God did something out of the ordinary in our day and in our generation. Not only did I have the privilege as a teenager, 16 years old, January the 23rd to see Brother Branham, 1950, the first time, I was privileged to be present the night that the pillar of fire was photographed over his head on June the 24th. I was there, but I did not see the pillar of fire. It was not until I was 32 years old that I really understood what God was doing to our generation. At 32, I don't think I really understood. It was not until Brother Branham had been taken away from us for a while that I took time to listen instead of just watching what was happening, but to begin to listen to the Word. And it was the Word that really brought the revelation to my heart, what God was doing and had done in our generation. So each and every one of us still has the availability of that voice. Even though we may not see, we can still hear. You see, even in Revelation it said, let he that hath ears hear what the Spirit hath to say to the churches. Not see, but hear. And you know, once you hear it, you can even see it. Because you understand it. I was 19 years old when I first had the privilege to meet Brother Billy Paul and he was 17. Some of those experiences he related to you last night and Brother Billy nor I, neither one realized when we first met what God was going to do or what God was doing at that time. But as I have tried to look at the audience this morning, I don't know if there's anybody that knew Brother Billy Paul before he was 17. But maybe I'm also privileged this morning to have known him the longest of anyone that's present here. And I'd like for you people to know what my attitude is toward this. I believe that just as it was in the book of Acts, after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, that people had a lot of questions. There were things that Jesus had said publicly, like the Beatitudes, or things that later the men like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they set them down in writings, which at the time that they wrote them, they had no idea they would become known as Holy Bible or Scripture, or that it would mean to future generations what John 3.16 has meant to us. Many of the things that you read that those, those four... Uh, gospel writers wrote were things that they heard Jesus say in private. You remember Jesus took Peter, James and John many times with him in private and said things. And what Jesus said to them in private affected what those three, how they understood what Jesus said even to everybody. And you can see it in their writings like when Jesus said about the time of the foot washing, you're not all clean. A little footnote. He spoke this because Judas was in the midst. Jesus didn't say that, but that was a little footnote to help, help us to understand what it was. And I'm certain after the ascension of Jesus, there were people that had children, young people, they had business situations, and they came to those that were close to Jesus. And there was one of them named James, that in the Scriptures it refers to him as the Lord's brother. One close to Jesus. And he became somewhat the head of the church in Jerusalem. Not because he was an ecclesiastical, spiritual elected head, but because people had confidence, yes. believing that if they would ask James, James, what did Jesus do when he was faced with this? How did he react? How did it feel to be with him? We have a privilege like that today if we can place it. Brother Branham said there'd be another book of Acts written after it. 
the things that's happening in our lives now is the acts of the Holy Spirit doing them. And if we would write them today and we would write them in the King James language, put these and thou's, it wouldn't read any different than the book of Acts reads. It's a real privilege and pleasure this morning to have Brother Branham's oldest son, Brother Billy Paul, to come and to share with us his personal testimony. Young people, you're having an opportunity to hear firsthand from a personal witness. Don't miss the opportunity. Do you know what it is? Jesus Christ Himself said, Truly a lie shall first come and restore all things. You're going to have the opportunity this morning to hear a person who lived with that one that Jesus Christ Himself said would come. Jesus called him Elijah because he was of that spirit. But we believe that when he was born on this earth, his parents named him by the will of God, William Marion Branham. God thought enough of him in that name that he tells his life story in the mountains on the Idaho-Montana border. And let's stand in reverence and in awe this morning of what we are about to hear. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Vaughn, one verse of amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but this morning pay very close attention and may I just remind you again you're sitting in a place today that I know at least 400,000 people yes. would like to be sitting in your seat yes. this morning yes. from Australia to New Zealand yes. to Alaska yes. to Japan yes. to yes. South America to yes. Africa to India to Pakistan yes. Yes. many of those people would think it was the grandest privilege they could have today yes. To sit in the chair you're sitting in. So don't go to sleep. Don't slump in your chair. Pay attention to what you're given the opportunity to hear today. Brother Billy Paul. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Perry. God bless you, Cuba. Thank you, Brother Perry. I don't deserve that, but I thank you for that. And Brother Vaughn, would you keep playing there? Before we sit down, you know we're getting close to the end. This message is like a, a road map. It tells you where you start. And it shows you the end out there. There's no detours. It's a one-way street. It leads to heaven. And it's only a predestinated people that can walk that road. And God so loves you that he died that you might be well. Amen. And then he sent William Branham to tell you what's the truth. That's right. I like the way you worship this morning. I like the way you praise the Lord Jesus. I don't believe you should just be dead. I believe you should be a praise in your heart, like our brother said there. I don't believe, like I said when we sing that song, Standing on the Promises, I don't believe we should sit on the premises. I believe we should get up and give God praise. We're the most privileged people there are in the world today. And let's turn around and shake hands with one another as we sing that verse once again. When we've been there 10,000 years. Brother Branham said when we get over there, he said Noah will gather with his people. And he says and they'll talk about the time that they got in the ark and come across. And he said Moses will gather with his people and they'll talk about the time that they got together at the Red Sea. And he says, and all of them will be gathered together. He said, but you will be gathered with me and we'll talk about these times. And I believe we'll talk about this day over there. So as we sing it, let's turn around and love one another and say, When we've been there, bright shining eyes. Yeah.
God. Let us just bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you once again, we want to thank you for your loving kindness to us. Thank you, Lord, as the sun is shining. And Lord, not only is the S-U-N shining, but the S-O-N is shining in our hearts today. Lord, I thank you for the privilege that I have to be up here in the mountains, Lord. Lord, where I was with your prophet on several occasions, Lord. And Lord, I believe this morning that those prayers that were prayed is being answered today. For Lord, you're a prayer answering God. And Lord, your prophet said that you could never fail. And Lord, we know there's many needs among us today. And Lord, I have a need this morning. Lord, you give me the greatest privilege that there is, Lord. And that's to stand before the bride of Jesus Christ and to be a witness, Lord. And Lord, help me to do and say those things that is pleasing to Thee. Don't let me say anything, Lord, that would be out of order in any way. Bless Your people and speak to us. Lord, we need You. We need You now, Lord, more than we've ever needed You before. Lord, we follow the blueprint. Lord, where we fail, get us back on the track. Lord, where we've turned a corner and You wasn't with us, Lord, let us get back in line. Let us walk that straight, narrow way that your prophet walked. Grant it, Lord, for we know that the hour is so close. And Lord, I pray especially for the young people this morning. Lord, what an honor to sit here. And Lord, last night as we sat here and talked and seen the expression upon their faces, and Lord, the questions that they asked, it wasn't just in a myth, but they asked it was sincerely in their heart. And I pray, Lord, that what was done and said was pleasing unto thee. Bless us in a special way today, Lord. Be with your little bride around the world. And we'll be careful to give thy name all the praise, the honor, and the glory. For it's all you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Bob, sister. I count it a privilege to be here with you this morning and to give a few minutes of testimony and it's kind of hard to get started and it's hard to get stopped. But I enjoyed the service last night and I want to thank you young people for your kindness and the questions that you asked and the manner that you wrote them in and the, and the sweetness of the spirit that you gave them in. And Brother Joseph said, when I get up for Easter, you're going to have a good time. And truly, I've had a good time. And we thank the Lord for it. And we ask you to pray for us at home. The burden is heavy. And Brother Floyd knows. And the work of spoken word and the voice of God. There's many things. And I don't have much to do there. I'm kind of the spare time. When they get a little flat, they kind of run and ask for a little help. And I do what I can. But it's just an honor to do anything for the Lord Jesus and His people. And Brother Floyd and Brother Perry and... Brother Mike and Brother here and Brother Garcia and Brother Dalton, when you invited me to come up, I thank you for it. And to see how you conducted your service, it makes me proud of you. And I know that many times that you feel like you're neglected, but you're not. There's a great God that's got an eye on you. There's a mom and daddy that's praying for you. There's a pastor that's standing there waiting for you. And there's a message here that gives you the guideline how to get there. And all you got to do is just line up with it and walk in it. I thank you kids for inviting me and I trust that by our coming together that God received the glory and that we all received the blessing. Thank you for the nice gift, the shirt. Like I said, I really appreciated that and everything. And, and Sister Francis, thank you for the nice gift and all of you. And there was a sister coming to me last night. And, you know, I don't get a chance to say this very often, Brother Francis, so i got to say it. She said, I saw you three years ago, and she said, you look terrible. She said, you look younger now than you did. And wherever you're at, sister, God bless you. I appreciate that. That just made my night, I tell you. But, you know, we're getting close to that time. And to Brother Tim, I don't know where he's at. Brother Timmy, last night, I thank him and Sister Brenda for the way that they asked the question. Didn't you think that was beautiful? Amen. I really appreciated that and the way you conducted yourselves. And, you know... Sometimes, like I told you, I said, I told my dad one time, I said, the devil's always after me. And he said, that's good because he ain't got you. I was listening to Brother Tommy Osborne one day. And he said, I was looking out my window. And he said, and I looked and he says, and I saw a vision. And he said, I saw a whole bunch of devils coming down the street. And he said, and as he was coming down the street, he said, he said, the devil was standing there and he was giving them orders. He said, go in that house. And he says, get them young people to go to the dances. And said, the old dancing devil went in there and said, they come out and they were just a shouting and a praising the Lord. You know, just a shouting and a going on. And he said, did you work? He said, yep. He said, they're all going to dance Saturday night. He said, he went on over there and he said, look down the street. And he said, he told him, he said, go in that house there. He said, there's a young couple who just got married. He said, I want you to go in there and bust that home up. 
And he said the little devils went in there and he said he got to work and he said he went on through and he said he sent a smoking devil and a drinking devil and all that. And finally they come to Brother Osborne's house and they said, now you go in there. And about that time the little devil run in there like that and he come out and he shook his head like that and he said, what's wrong with you? He said, I like they got killed. And he said, what's wrong? He said, there's a man of God in there. And about that time the devil spoke up and he said, I went in there myself and said, like they got killed. So I think sometimes we have to keep our house in order. Amen? Like I told you kids, how many of you heard me tell my little story about the football? You remember my little football story? Well, I'll tell it to you then. Okay, so there was a football game one time, and there was there was two teams. There was the big de the big animals and the little animals. And said so the big animals, you know, they like to bluff, you know, like they do in school. Said so, you know, do this and do that, and you're one of us. And said the big animals was playing football, and the little animals was playing football. And said so, <clears throat> the little, little animals just couldn't do nothing. Said so, them had big animals just walk all over top of them. And said so, at about halftime the score was fifty to nothing. They said little animals are still in the game, but they were sure getting beat. And they said about that time, they went into the locker room like that and says, the, the coach says, well, boys, he says, we're doing the best we can. He said, but we're sure getting stomped. He said, all I can tell you is to go out there and take what you got and do the best you can. And that's kind of the way it is now, kids. Just take what you got and do the best you can. He said they got out there on the line and said it was halftime. And said about that time, the big old... Elephant got the ball and he said, give it to me. He said, I'll show you how to run over these little ones. He said, he got the old ball down like that there and said, the little animals was down on the line of screamings like that. So he took that ball and he put it underneath his trunk and down through where he went and said, something hit that guy. He said, down he went on his back. The trunk come open. The ball flew out and said, so he laid there and kicked. And he said, what in the world hit me? And something said, I don't know what that thing was, but it like it killed me too. And said, about the second scrimmage, he come down like that and said, the, uh, said the lion said, give me that ball. Said, I made four touchdowns the first half. Said, I'll show you how to get through there. And said, here he come and he run right into them little fellas. And said, something got him and grabbed him and throwed him on the ground and like to kill him. He got up and shook his head like that. The game was a little bit different then. So the coach of the little animals went over to the coach of the big animals and he says, what in the world kind of defense is that? He said, well, son, he said, that's called a centipede. He said, he's got a thousand legs. He said, where in the world was he at in the first half? He said, he was in the locker room getting his shoes on. <laughs> I think that's kind of the way it is with us, young people. We've been in the locker room about 20 years getting our shoes on, but we're going to walk all over that devil. Amen? So we love you this morning, and we thank you for the privilege for us to be here and to have this time of fellowship. And You know, we have friends. Brother Brandon said, we all have friends. And then he said, we have special friends. That's what I consider Brother Patterson, Brother Perry, Brother Mike, and Brother Dalton, and you all, you're my special friends. One day we're going to be together over there. And young people, you know, as Brother Perry was speaking there to you a few moments ago, the words he said, Satan's out to get you, but Satan's already defeated because God's already predestinated that you would be there. Pharaoh, when Moses went to him, he says, he had the word of the Lord. Moses had the word of the Lord. And he went to Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, sure, I'll let them go. He said, but you leave them young people behind. He said, you can go on and leave. You and all the old folks like Brother Perry's talking about, and I'm in that group. He said, go on and leave. He said, but leave the young ones behind. That's what Satan wants to happen now. But there ain't no way. Oh, no. Moses says, I ain't leaving a hook behind. He says, me, the young people and all, we're going because God promises. You might not think you're going, but you're going. Amen. You might stray, but you can't stay because we're on our way to Canaan land. Amen? Yeah. Mamas and dads, you might have prayed a long time, but today is the day that God's going to answer your prayer. Do you believe that? Yeah. Amen. You know, if it was out here, and I don't think you have too much out in Arizona, you know if there's a tornado coming? And everything, you say, well, how come Brother Billy says this, Brother Perry, my pastor, and, and all these, they always are harping, and not harping, but always saying, come in, come in. There's oncoming storms of judgment. Right. And if there's a storm coming, just sit in what you're thinking about. You got a girlfriend here? You got a boyfriend? You got friends? And if there was a warning to come out and said there's a tornado coming down through Prescott, and it's going to come right down this road, right through here, what would you do? You'd be looking for your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister, your sweetheart, your wife, your husband. You'd be saying, get to safety. Get to safety now. And that's what this message says. You might survive that tornado, but you're not going to survive the judgment of God. 
And that's what we're here for tonight, is to say if there's any kind of a tug in our lives, let's get it ready now. And I know you believe that. And I know, as Brother Perry said, God gave me the greatest privilege that there was. He gave me the privilege to be a son of God. To be a child of the King. To be a son of a prophet and to be a brother of a prophet. And I don't believe a man could ask for anything greater than that. And I, I, I don't say that, young people, that to make myself anything because I'm not nothing. But I want to tell you one thing. This message is eternal life to you this morning. And I want to just share a few things, maybe like when I was growing up, that would help you. I trust that it will. As I reflect back upon some of the things, when I started traveling with my dad, I was about 14 years old. And I shared a little of it with you last night. But you know, I wondered, I heard my dad talk about the angel and, and these things and how Brother Perry said when he was 17 when the angel of the Lord appeared there. And I wasn't in that meeting that Brother Perry was in. But when I was about, oh, I was about 10 years old, I guess it was, I was in Vandalia, Illinois. My dad had told me about the angel of the Lord. And, I, you know, I want you to understand Brother Billy's testimony now. He was daddy, but he was more than daddy. And it was a time that it was hard to separate the two. You understand what I'm saying? And I just want to kind of speak it to the young people here this morning, brothers and sisters. But I heard him tell about it, but I never had seen it. But yet I knew whatever he said was right. And I've seen God come and vindicate, but I wanted to see for myself. And I was just a little kid, 10 or 12 years old, and I was traveling with Dad in a tent meeting, and my Uncle Donnie was there. And we were staying in a little small hotel down in Vandalia, Illinois, and didn't even have a didn't even have a bathroom in, just had a little wash basin. And I was selling little books in the meetings called Jesus Christ the Same Yesterday and Forever, and I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision and divine healing and the brand campaigns, and my dad's brother Donnie was there. And about two o'clock in the morning, my dad woke me up and he had a pillow over my face. And he said, Paul? I said, Yes, sir. And he said, You know that angel that Daddy tells you told you about? And I said, Yes, sir. He said, he's here in the room with me tonight. And he said, now ask him if you could sing and if Donnie could sing. And he said, the angel said you can wake up Billy and let, let him see you. And that, that doesn't make me anything special. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But it's just the grace of God to me. And I'm a witness to you this morning, young people. He said, Dad, he said, Paul, when I take this pillow from your face, he said, you look over there in the corner. And he said, you know where the worst basin is? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, that angel that comes and tells Dad things, he said, he visited me tonight. And he said, he's standing right there in that corner. And he said, I, he said, I asked him if he could see you, if you could see him, and he said, yes. And he says, when Dad takes his pillow from your face, he said, you look over there. And he says, and you'll see him. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought an angel was something you know, flying around, you know, wings on, just going to town. But that's not the way it was. It was just like he said. There stood a man standing there about 200 pounds with his arms folded, dressed in white. Scared me to death. I grabbed my daddy like I was just a kid. And I grabbed him like that. I'll never forget what he said. He said, son, he said, he won't hurt you. And that man just sat there. He didn't say a word. He just looked at me. But I thank God for that experience in my life. He went from that being right out the window just like in a mist, like a, oh, someone asked him, was it a pillar of fire? No, it was just kind of a white mist. He just, he just disappeared and went right out that window. But from that time on, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, every time he come in that meeting, God knows I'm a witness to you this morning. I could feel his presence. And I want to tell you, it's not too far from where we are today. And the closer we get, to the Lord Jesus, the more real it becomes. You say, Brother Billy, that sounds like spiritualism or things. I don't know what you might call it, but I call it the presence of Jesus Christ. Brother Branham said when someone's gone on, he says, and you begin to speak about them. That's what he said. He said that presence comes near. And he said, that's the reason you should always speak about the Lord Jesus and have Him on your mind. He said, let me have Him be always near you. And when things come up at school and things come up in your life, just call His name. Like you asked me last night, did Brother Branham always pray out loud? No. Did Brother Branham always pray over loud over his food? No, but he always prayed. And that's the same thing you do. You might not say, Lord Jesus, help me, but in your heart you say, Lord Jesus, help me. 
And the moment you call upon Him, He's there to answer. And that's the same God that we serve today. And Brother Branham said, I always said this, I said it was so wonderful. I, 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 I said, I, I wish I could have the same testimony that Daddy can. And if my life is dedicated to the Lord Jesus like Brother Branham's, I can't be Brother Branham, but the same God that Brother Branham served is the same God that I serve. And the same God I serve is the same God that you serve. And there's no respect of person in any way. And I said, my daddy said, he said, I never asked the Lord Jesus for anything in my life that he didn't give it to me or come and tell me why he couldn't give it to me. Now, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, that's the way you know him. Like I said, I went up to the door one day and I knocked on the door real easy like that. And when I did, the door come open. He was going to the meetings. And we never talked to him, as you know, Brother Perry. And I just knocked on the door real easy like that, and the door came open. I'll never forget this, young people. He was down on his knees praying. And I think sometimes it's our approach to the Lord Jesus, the way we get it. And as he was down on his knees of praying, he didn't know I was there. It didn't make any difference whether he knew I was there or not. He'd still done it the same way. But it always something that stuck in my life. And I'll never forget that. He had his Bible laying out like this, and he had his hat, and he had his notes laying like this. And he had his head down, and he said, Excuse me, Father. Boy, I like that. He said, But when I was talking to you a while ago, he said, I forgot to ask you something. That's when you know him, boys and girls, on a one-to-one -one basis. If that would have been Brother Billy and I'd have thought of something, I'd said, Lord, bless Brother Perry. You know what I'm trying to say? I, I, you know. But no, Brother Brandon said, Excuse me, Father. He said, But when I was talking to you a few moments ago, I forgot to ask you something. That's what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters. It's our approach to what we get. I know in the meetings when I was traveling with my dad, there's many wonderful experiences that I could share with you, but I'm not going to take much time this morning. But as Brother Perry said, God so loved him. You see, why are you speaking about Brother Branham? Because that's the vessel that God chose to dwell in in your day. He's the messenger to the Lady of Sin Church age. He's the prophet to our age. He's the one that God so loved that He wrote of Him in this holy word. He wrote of Him in Malachi 4, Luke 17, 30, Revelation 10, 7, and all through the Scriptures. And God so loved Him that He said, I'm going to send Him to not the world, but unto you. Do you realize what I'm trying to tell you this morning? Not to everybody, but to you. And to know that you have ears to hear. To know that you was an attribute of God. That, that it was you that it was all about. That's what Christ went to Calvary for. This, that's what He sent Brother Branham for. Was for you. And then it's our attitude towards that as to what we receive. And I know you believe that. But, you know, Brother Branham said it ain't when, when you recognize who Jesus is, when you recognize who Brother Branham is. We know who that is. But it's when we recognize who we are, that we are the sons of God, the predestinated, the, the attributes of His mind, His thought. And all of this was for you and I. Isn't that a beautiful thought? And I know sometimes that we get all upset. And someone said, well, you know, I can't even understand Brother Branham. Said, like a man said one time, he said, Brother Branham's grammar was so poor. He said, he says, ain't and ain't and all this here. And I thought, you know, it never bothered me. Maybe it was because it was Dad. So I looked up in the dictionary one time, kids. I looked up to see what the word grammar meant. Because everybody's saying Brother Branham has such poor grammar. And you kids are smarter than me. But you know what grammar means? Grammar in the Webster Dictionary means the ability to make yourself understood. Amen. And if there's anybody in the generation that had his ability to make himself understood, it was the prophet of God of Malachi 4. He spoke our language. It wasn't something that we, we, we had to go and get a dictionary or go get someone to interpret for us. God interpreted His own Word. And when He sent Him, He brought Him on the ground that you and I live upon. I said He loved Him so much that His birth, as Brother Perry was speaking of a moment ago, until the angel of the Lord, the pillar of fire, hung over the bed where He was born. He loved Him so much that He come and said, You won't live in, down here. You'll live close to a town called New Albany. And then on 19 and 33, when he was baptizing down in the river, the angel of the Lord came down and said, As John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of Christ, you will forerun his second coming. Amen. He loved him so much that when he went to the cave, and when he went up there to pray, the angel of the Lord said, He said, If you can get the people to believe you, nothing will stand before your prayer, not even cancer. And He's the same God tonight. He's still Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And anything that we have need of, whatever we have need of, if we ask and believe, we can receive it. 
He, he said, if you'll get the people to believe you, nothing will stand before your prayer. He said, you'll pray for kings and monarchs and potentates. I'm a witness to you today, young people, that he prayed for King Gustafson of Sweden. He prayed for King George of England. He prayed for me and he prayed for you. And I think that's the greatest thing that there is. That prayer that he prayed was answered among us today. Amen? I know I see Brother Dalton sitting here and I see Brother Ed Dalton back here. He prayed for his children. And he says, I give them to you in the name of Jesus Christ. They're there, aren't they, Brother Ed? God's Word cannot fail. You say, well, my kid's this, my kid's that. No, your kid's just out on a little trip, but your kid's coming back because God's Word cannot fail. I, I know that. I know it's hard for you to believe that, but I'm just here to be a witness to you. God's so loving till He says a great portion of heaven awaits you. And He says, everyone that you love and everyone that loved you, I have given to you on that day. Brothers and sisters, what a reunion, what a time that lays just ahead. And someone asked me one time, said, Brother Patterson used to let me do the books over at Spoken Word and how I appreciated that. And Brother Joseph helped me, let me do a little bit of them there now too. And I used to get in there and I'd get there and Brother Patterson said, now Brother Billy says, it don't make any difference what anybody else says. He said, you just hear what Brother Branham said. He said, I want to trust your ears. And, and he says, you just listen and whatever Brother Branham says, you put it down. He said, I don't care if somebody else has got it down different. You put what you hear. And I, I wouldn't just go in there haphazardly. And I'm not putting myself, I don't mean that away, but I mean, I'd say, God, let me hear. Let me hear just what he has to say. And, you know, now I don't want to be a hearer, but I want to be a doer. But this particular time, I was just getting to listen to the words. And I was sitting there and someone asked me one day, they said, I think he kind of got on Brother Patterson a little bit too, but they asked me, they said, how come you say, when Brother Branham says, and, 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 he says, you put and, and, and. They said, why don't you just put one and? I said, because he said, and, and, and. And they said, why don't you just put one and? So that's better grammar. I said, well, I imagine it might have been better grammar when Jesus was here when he said, verily, verily. I said, but the scripture don't say verily, it said, verily, verily. And I believe he's the same God today. I believe that the prophet of God said, and, and, we say, and, and. And I believe that that's the same thing today. You believe that? Amen. Amen. And one time I was there, and I won't get into much of this, but I'm just going to let you know a little something. One day I was with Brother Branham and we're standing in the meetings, and I, like I told you a while ago, it's your approach. It's your attitude. And my attitude has been so wrong, and my approach has been so wrong. I've gotten to the place to where I thought, I don't want to live no more. And you know, I, I know they say 80% of all teenage suicide, broken homes, alcohol, drugs, that's nothing but a lie of the devil, kids. If he can destroy you, he's got a one. But he can't get you. All he can do is stand there and bluff at you. Just holler at you. Just nick at you just enough to make you worry. But what it does, what I talked to you about last night, it makes you call upon him that much more. And get that much closer to him. Like I told my wife, she's not here. I'll block it out there. I said, Lois, do you love me? She says, you know I love you. And she does. And I said, I said, well, why don't you tell me? And she says, I do. She says, I wash your clothes. I do this. I keep you up this. And I said, but I want you to put your arm around me and hug me. I want you to come up and kiss me. I want you to walk up to me and say, I love you. I'm proud of you. And she says, you know I do. I said, I know you do, but I want to hear you say it. And he knows you love him, but he wants to hear you say it. Kids. He wants to hear you say, I love you. When that boyfriend or that girlfriend or your husband or your wife, they love that. And the more she tells me she loves me, the more I want to get far and do far. There's nothing that I wouldn't do for her when she does that. And I believe that's the same way the Lord Jesus is with us because we are His children and He wants us to adore Him, to love Him, to worship Him and to praise Him. And I know you do and I don't mean them in no wrong. But you know, I remember one time I was standing in a meeting I was bringing the sick people up to my dad. And as we was... A little lady walked up to my dad. She said, Brother Branham. He looked at her and he said, Sister, I don't see nothing wrong with you. And I thought, now what's this? Because Daddy, I, there was no mistakes. And there won't be no mistakes. Because it was God speaking through him. And I thought, what's this lady doing up here? And she's got a prayer card and she's got all this. And I didn't even look at her prayer card. But she says, Brother Branham said, ain't nothing wrong with you. 
And I thought, well, how did I give that woman a prayer card and ain't nothing wrong with her and all these things? And I'll never forget that, young people. She said, Brother Branham? She says, no. She said, there's nothing wrong with me physically. She said, I've come up here to apologize to you. And he said, what for? And he said, I don't see nothing wrong with you. And she said, no, Brother Branham. She says, a couple years ago I was in your meetings. And she said, when I was in your meetings, she said, I had a desire in my heart. She said, I wanted a child. And she said, you looked at me and told me the desire of my heart. She said, you want a child? And said, go and receive a child in Jesus Christ's name. She said, I went and I was happy. She said, I told my husband and my family about it. She said, they all made fun of me. And she said, it, they, can't, it, they said, it can't happen. And she said, Brother Branham, I begin to doubt what you said. That's a very dangerous thing, young people. Yes. This word, the written word and the spoken word, if we don't understand it, we just say it anyway. We don't doubt it. We rest upon it. Like that song you sang, which was so timely, United We Stand. And that's what we're talking about now. And as you stood there, she said, Brother Branham, she says, I know that what you said was right. She said, but it was my unbelief. Brother Branham said, Sister, he said, what did the angel of God speak to me and say? She said, it said that I would have a baby. He said, Sister, I don't care whether you disbelieve it, whether your husband disbelieves it, whether your family disbelieves it, your relatives disbelieve it. She said, he said, if God spoke it, you'll have it. Nine months later, we got a letter from her. She said, I got a fine nine-pound baby boy. If God thought it, the prophet spoke it, I believe it, and that settles it. We don't need to have to worry about how it's going to be, whether it's going to be this away or that away. It'll be just the way that God spoke it. And I think that's sometimes how we get in a lot of trouble, that we try to figure it all out. And when we get it all figured out, we got it all figured out wrong. And I know I've done that so many times, but God so loved him that he sent him to you and I. The people so loved him. I had an uncle, the other, excuse me, a cousin the other day. His name is Charlie Conlon. He's not a Christian man. He said, Billy, I want to tell you a little story. And I said, okay, Charlie. He said, you remember my boy, Chucky? And you kids wouldn't know him now. I forget, I forget, I think he weighs about 280 pounds. He plays football. Just a, oh, he's just a big hunk of man, you know. And he says, he says, you remember, he said, you don't remember when Chucky was born, do you? I said, no, I sure don't. He said, he only weighed a pound and four ounces. He said, they had him in a little thing like this in the hospital. He had to weigh two pounds or something before they even put him in the thing there if they have it. just had needles off doing. The doctor said, he won't live 24 hours. He says, I went to find Brother Bill. And he says, when I went to find Brother Bill, he said, you know, I don't live the life. He said, but I knew if I could get to Brother Bill. God loved him and the people loved him. He said, if I could get to Brother Bill, I said, I knew Chucky would live. He said, I went and got Brother Bill, and he says, will you go to the hospital with me? He said, Charlie, said, I, I, I think he was cutting his grass or something. He said, I just got on my overalls. He said, Brother Bill, said, my baby's just got a few minutes to live. He said, will, will you go? He said, sure, Charlie. He ran out to the hospital, and they wouldn't let him go into where the isolation ward was. He said, I don't need to go in there, Charlie. He said, I'll just kneel down right here. He said, I'll just kneel down here on this floor. And he said, he knelt down on the hospital floor with the people around him. And he said, God... He said, go in that room and touch that baby for your honor and glory. And that boy's 20-something years old today and has a perfect hell. That's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loved him so much and the people loved him so much until a woman said, let me just walk. Let me just walk where that man walked and I'll be healed. She said, I don't have to go there. She said, he don't have to pray for me. He said, just let me walk upon the ground where he walked. And I'll be made well. I think like when they laid in the shadow of Peter. It's our respect. And that's our approach to what we get. And I say this to you because you don't know what lays ahead of you. Satan will be after you after this camp. You're united now. There's a whole bunch of you there. And he's a little scared to come in here now because he'll be right out that door. But when he gets you alone, he likes to, you know, he likes to show his stuff. But just let that greater is he that's in you than the he that's after you take effect, and you'll see what it'll do. A lady one time, Brother Perry was speaking to you a moment ago about when the angel of the Lord, the picture was taken, the pillar of fire. You remember that? Brother Branham said a man looked at that picture, 
and laughed. He didn't say a word, kids. He laughed in his heart. But the prophet knows the secrets of the heart because God knows it and he reveals them to his prophets. Brother Branham said it was nothing less than to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. A lady was laying dying in the hospital, young folks. She just had a few hours to live. She had that same picture sitting over beside her bed. She looked over at that picture. She looked up to the Lord Jesus and she said, Lord, I know that that's your prophet. And she said, I know that pillar of fire is you that had his picture taken with him. And she said, if I could get to Brother Branham or if he is here, she said, I'd be well. Now her attitude and her approach was altogether different than that man's. And she said, if I could get there to him, she said, I know I'd be healed. She said, but I know you're Hebrews 13, 8, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And her testimony was that that light come out of that picture, come over to her bed, and she was perfectly healed. One looked and laughed and died. One looked, believed, and lived. It's our approach and our attitude to what we get. There was a little sister, I don't think she'd mind me telling you, her husband was an alcoholic, kids. He was a great man. He was a wonderful person, but he just drank all the time. And I know there's people here that knows him, so I'm not going to mention his name. And she'd come to the meetings, and he'd, he'd let her come all the time. And when he did, he didn't have anything, you know, he didn't serve the Lord, but he never stopped her from coming. But he just drank all the time. He wouldn't go to bars. But he'd just come home and maybe drink two cases of beer a day. Just start when he got home from work and just drink and drink and drink to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning until he passed out. Get up the next day and go to work. Come back the same time, next day the same thing. Said her icebox was constantly full of beer. But he always let her come to meetings. And he never said anything about her serving the Lord. You know what? She walked up to the grave of Brother Branham Gibbs one day. And she was standing there. And she remembered that message that Brother Branham called the rising of the sun. And said there was quickening power in our body. And said there was so much quickening power in a prophet one time to where there's in a great battle and the prophet had died. And he had been over there. He had been laying there for a long time. He was rotten away. So they just took a dead man and threw it on top of them bones and said, that man come to life. And she said, I believe you're the same God today. And she said, I know that Brother Branham was your prophet. And she says, and I know right there is his bones. And she said, I know if you'd pray for my husband that he'd be well. She said, but I'm just going to reach down and I'm going to take a little bit of dirt. She took her handkerchief and she wrapped it up. She opened it up. She put that dirt in there. That's what she gave me a handkerchief for with her. And she watered it up and she took it home. She said, when she took it home, she said, about a day or two later, she said, she just felt impressed to do it. She said, while she was laying there, she said, she was sitting there in her room. She said, that man was laying there and said, he got drunk again. She said, Lord, I can't take this no more. Something said, go get that dirt. Amen. Both ends coming together. And her testimony is that she walked up there, Brother Patterson. She took that dirt and he was sound asleep, passed out. And she just put it all over the top of him. She said, I do this in the name of Jesus Christ. The man never drank one more time from that time to this. He's still Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe it's our approach, like I said. And I know there's many times that, that you know, we think things. I remember one time I was a little kid, about 15, 16 years old. And if you're that little, don't make, I didn't mean it that way. But I was a young person about that time. And my dad was over in Arkansas in a meeting. I'll never forget this. He had a little girl up beside him. He pulled her up real close to him. She had epilepsy. Now, I'm saying these things to kind of help you down the road. A little child had epilepsy and it was so bad it had a clothespin in the child's mouth right, holding its tongue so it wouldn't swallow it. My dad would pray for that child and that child got worse and worse and worse. Now, I never saw anything quite like that because whenever I see daddy pray I see things happen. I didn't understand that but I knew better than to say anything. I just watched it. Finally he said, people put your head down. The people put their head down. He prayed. The child got worse. He said, I don't understand. He said, everybody put your head down so I can't get this devil to leave. And he prayed again. Nothing happened. The kid just got worse. Finally, Brother Brandon, he looked. He looked right up there in the balcony and I'll never forget this. He said, sir, you up there in that brown suit. He said, would you put your head down? He said, I can't get this spirit to leave this child. And that man just sat there and just looked at him like that. 
He said, sir, would you please put your head down in reverence? The man wouldn't do it. I'll never forget my dad. He pulled that child up to him. He said, Heavenly Father, don't let that man's unbelief keep this from happening. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of this child. That little child was perfectly whole. That man fell in the balcony with an epileptic fit. That night after the meeting, the wife brought him around there to Brother Branham. She brought him out to the door. And when she brought him there to the door, she said, Brother Branham, would you pray for him? Brother Branham, she said, he's a minister. I said, he didn't mean that. Brother Branham said, I'm sorry. He said, I can't pray for him. He said, I've already done. I asked him to put his head down. He said, I have no control over it now. So if you don't understand, young people, be careful what you say. Yeah, that's right. Just believe it and say, God, I might not understand it, but I believe it just that way. I know when I was growing up, there was many things that happened in my home and with me that I didn't understand. I've seen so many great, wonderful miracles. But then I got a place in my life to where I thought I knew more than anybody else. Yeah. And this is the part I don't want to tell, but I feel led to tell you. And I decided I want to leave home. And if you're away from home, I don't mean it to you. But I want to be a witness to you this morning. It's the worst mistake you'll ever make. It's the worst mistake you'll ever make. If you've got a Christian mother and father that's praying for you, love them. Respect them. If you can't live it, just do the best you can. Like an old black brother at our church, he said, Lord, give me the Holy Ghost. He said, Lord, if you don't give me the Holy Ghost, I'll just live holy anyway. So I kind of think that's the way we are. Lord, if I can't do all of this message, I'll just do with the part that i got, like Mark Twain says, until the rest comes along. Like Brother Brennan said, he said, if this ain't that, I'll just keep this till that comes. But I left home, young people. I was about, I don't know how old I was. I wasn't very old up here, I'll guarantee you. But like I told you last night in my testimony and the questions you asked me, I began to do things that wasn't right and I'd sneak out. And I knew I was doing wrong. But I'd done it anyway because I wanted to see what it was all about. I wanted to get out there and, you know, rub shoulders with the world. And, you know what they call the in crowd and all these things. There are a couple things I'm going to tell you here I've never told nobody. But I, I really feel led to tell you. And I trust that it's Him that's leading me. But when I went out begin to do these things like I told you last night I came in and dad you know he knew all the time but he was a wonderful dad and my mother and I could hear him all the time they prayed for me and the more they prayed the more resentful you know what I mean you know how you, what I'm talking about but I just wanted to go out and see what it was all about so like I told you he said you can't do that and live here son and I began to drink I began to smoke, began to run with a rough crowd. I'll never forget one night after I left home to get to my testimony. I won't take it just a, about ten more minutes of your time. When I got ready to leave, he took me out to the garage. And he said, son, he said, this home is not dad's and mom's. He said, it's just that that Jesus lets us live in to raise you children. He said, but Paul, I can't let you do that and stay here at home. He said, because I love him and I respect him. And he says, I know that you don't want to do them things. He says, but you're doing them. He says, what do you want to do? He said, I, I can't make you be a Christian and neither can your parents and neither can your pastor. It's a choice that you've got to make. He says, but what do you want to do? And I thought I was a little bad Bill, you know. thought I could do anything. And I thought I could fight anything that, you know, had on pants that wanted to fight. You know, you know what I'm talking about, just that age. I said, I want to leave home and go out and live in the world. And I thought I was macho, you know. He said, okay, son. He said, before you go, will you do me one favor? And I said, sure, Dad. 
He said, I want you to hold out your hands. So I just held my hands out to my dad like that. He was washing his car. He said, no, I don't mean like that, Billy. I said, how do you mean, Daddy? He said, I want you to hold your hands out like this. So I did. I wished I hadn't have left, kids. But I held my hands out like this. He said, I want you to turn around and look on the wall, son. And kids, I'll never forget. I turned around and I looked on that wall behind me. And Daddy went like this. He said, there's a perfect cross that's shadow on that wall. He said, there you stand today, Paul. He said, you're making your choice today. He said, you see that road there? I said, yes, sir. He said, it leads to hell. My hands were still out. And he went right on down me. He said, you see that road there? I said, yes, Daddy. He said, that leads to heaven. Eternal life. He said, you're standing right here in the middle of that cross today. He said, you're making your choice. He said, you told me you want to go this road to hell. He said, you know that's where it leads? And I said, yes, sir. He said, that's where you want to go. I said, no, I don't want to go to hell, but I want to go down that road. He said, that's where it'll end up. He said, but son, I've claimed you over here. He said, I've applied the token to you. And he said, somewhere down that road, he said, God's going to get a hold of you, son, when you start down that road. And he said, he's going to turn you around. And he's going to bring you back because he said, in the end, you're going to be over here because I claim you in Jesus Christ's name. It's a rough road back, kids. There ain't nothing out there. And I know I'm talking to Christian kids. And I know you probably ain't even got these. But just in case it comes up, I want you to have a little guard up there to hit the devil right between the eyes with. See, I heard an old gray-headed man stand and give his testimony to me on August the 3rd that he went down that road. But Lord Jesus, you brought him back. Brother Branham said, he said, the way rough is back. He said, Paul told the Romans, kids, this killed me when I read this. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thy and thy house shall be saved. That's for us mothers and fathers. He said, you've got enough faith for yourself to be saved. Have faith enough no matter how wavered that boy or girl gets. They'll be saved anyway. He says, because God somehow, if He has to lie them there on His back in a hospital dying, they'll be saved. Now don't forget that, kids. Lying on your back in a hospital dying, they'll be saved. God promised it. The inheritance. Old, a, they shall be there, said Isaiah, and A-L-L, -L, their offsprings with them. All of their offsprings with them. I went down that road. I started doing those things. I left home. Next thing you know, I've gotten completely out in the world. And this is one thing I'm going to tell you. And I was speaking a little bit on respects. And I never told nobody this, I guess. I don't know whether I know my wife knows it and Brother Joseph and just some of the family, but I never forget one night and I hope this don't hurt you, I hope it'll help you. But I walked into a poker game and it was illegal to play poker in our country. And I love to play cards. And I walked into a poker game in Jeffersonville one night. Like I said, it was against the law, and they was right up all the time. And the dealer was sitting around the poker table. You know how it is. And they weren't letting nobody in the game, only those that they know. And I walked into the poker game, and, and I said, Can I play? Two or three of the guys at the table said, No, it's a closed game. So one of the guys spoke to the dealer, and he says, Do you know him? And the dealer said, Sure, I know him. He said, Let him play. And he said, well, who is he? And this killed me, kids. He said, that's Reverend Branham's boy. Oh, man. I said, no, nah, I'm not Brother Branham's boy. I said, no, nah, I'm not Reverend Branham's boy. The dealer said, well, I know you. He said, you're Billy Paul. He said, you're w William Branham's boy. And I said, no, I'm not. I said, William Branham wouldn't have a boy like me. And I turned around and walked out of that poker game, kids. There was something down in there that I couldn't identify him in that poker game. You know there's something down inside of you that won't let you identify with the things of the world. They might be out there and they might be tempting you, but there's something down inside that says, that's not you. There's something greater in life for you. But I kept on going. I kept on doing those things. I began to smoke and drink, you know, when we get into those things. And then one time, like I told you in the beginning, I become very sick. 
my dad was gone and everybody was gone and I I had something happen in my stomach and I walked across the street from church one night going over to my uncle's house and I fell in the street I don't remember a thing for several hours next thing I knew they had me in the hospital I was just a kid I was just a, just a young person like you are and they said they began to examine me and they said he's got a dual ulcer it's perforated gangrene is setting in so we're going to cut his bowel open here on the side take the bowel out so they're going to do a colostomy I was just a kid you're talking about getting right with God I said I want to see my daddy I wasn't worried about being away from home then there was something different I said I want to see daddy they tried to get him and they couldn't get him they called for days and they couldn't get him then they decided they were going to operate my grandmother signed the papers and I'll never forget that morning they was going to operate on me they had prepared me the night before and I was going to have this operation the rest of my life with a colostomy bag on my side now like I said I was just, just a young boy that morning about 7 o'clock they was going to operate I think at 9, 8 or 9 I was laying in bed I felt someone touch me on the shoulder remember that quote I just read you remember what I just read you said he might have to lay them there in the hospital on their back dying I know it's a quote but it was real in my life he said but they'll be there and all of their offsprings with them he said but God might have to lay them there on the hospital dying that was exactly what happened to me he laid his hand on my shoulder and I looked up at him he said what's wrong son and I said daddy we've been trying to get you for days and kids I'll never forget those words he looked down at me and he said the way of a transgressor is hard he could have operated on me with no way of sake nothing could have hurt as bad as that I said yes sir he said Paul you remember when you was a little boy and was in the meetings and I said yeah he said you remember that angel of the Lord that daddy let you see that day I said yeah I said, Daddy, we've tried to get a hold of you for days. I said, we've called the state police and everything. He said, I know. He said, they couldn't, didn't know where I was at. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I was up on top of the mountain, right up here in Colorado. He said, I was up there with the family. He said, that same one that always speaks to me, that you saw, come. He said, go to Billy quick. He's in trouble. He said, the way of a transgression is hard, ain't it, son? I said, yes, sir. I said, Daddy, pray for me. He said, no. No, I can't pray for you. I said, why? He said, because I didn't do no sinning. He said, you're the one that done the sinning. He said, you're the one that needs to do the praying. That day on that hospital, I give my heart to the Lord Jesus. I rededicated my life to Him. And I'll never forget this, kids. A doctor walked in. He said, Brother Brown, I'm glad you're here. And he went on through the story. He said... Billy's real bad. He says, I hate to do this. He's the best only thing can save his life. He said, it's already set in the gangrene. He said, he ain't got long unless we do this. Daddy said, Dr. Bruner, he said, Billy's been away from the Lord. He said, would you take him up and examine him one more time? He said, Brother Brown, so we've examined him twice a day. And he said, he's just bleeding inside. And he said, we can't delay any longer. He said, just once more, will you do it? He said, sure. They took me up there. They done quit bleeding. And I was perfectly made well. And as you can see, I can just eat anything I want to. He's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I know, kids, that it's hard for you. But when I was out there, I had one of the hardest battles that I ever had. Yours might be something you might not even have any. But mine was cigarettes. I couldn't give them up. I just couldn't. I tried to serve the Lord with all of my heart, but... I just couldn't quit smoking. And I hope you still love me as much when I get through. But everything else was okay. But then cigarettes wouldn't leave me. That's an awful thing, kids. If you've never done it, don't ever try it. Right. And it went on and on and on. But Daddy was like a real daddy. He just he kept standing there with me. One day we was riding up the road going fishing. He looked over at me. I tried to quit smoking. Oh, my. I threw away enough Ronson lighters to buy a new car. 
That's the truth. I'd throw my cigarettes and my lighters out and go back and pick them up the next day. Go buy me another one. I'd go back and throw them out. And I wasn't just doing that for a show. I was sincere. I wanted to get rid of them things, but it wouldn't leave. We was riding up the road one day, and I had my cigarettes hid real good way over here in his pocket. And Dad was driving. He couldn't see him, you know. And I had them way over here like this and was riding up the road. He looked over at me, and he was just driving along. He said, Paul? And I said, yeah. He said, you still smoking? Oh, me. And I said, uh, I said, yes, sir. And he said, I thought you was. And I just rode down the window of that truck. I took him cigarettes and that lighter, you know, 975th time, I guess, you know. And out the window they went. He rode about a half a mile, kids, down the road. He stopped that car, and he said, Paul? I said, yes, sir. He said, did you ever do that before? I said, what, Daddy? He said, did you ever throw your cigarettes away before? I said, oh, hundreds of times, I guess, Daddy. He said, was you ever sincere about it? And I said, every time. Now, I'm not just saying that. I mean, I, I really was. I wanted to quit them nasty things. He turned that car around, and here he come back down the road. Remember how I told you last night? He knew just how to do everything just right. God showed him just what to do. He said, let's go find them cigarettes. I thought, Lord, I just threw them away 30 seconds ago, you know. He said, let's go find them cigarettes. And I thought, man, I just got rid of them things. I don't want to see them because there's too much temptation. He said, let's go find them. I said, okay. So down the road we went. He said, about where was it? And I said, oh, right along in here somewhere, Dan. They looked over there, and I said, there they are. And there laid them luckies and that old cigarette lighter laying there beside the road. He turned that car right around the road and stopped. He said, is that them? I said, yeah. He said, you've been battling it for a long time, haven't you, son? I said, I sure have. He said, you ever been sincere about it? I said, every time. He said, but today we're going to drive a stake down. He said, right here in the middle of this road. He said, it ain't no coincidence, son, today. I said, why is that? He said, look where those cigarettes are laying. And I looked, and there was a cross. And it said, get right with God. And he said, it wasn't no coincidence, Billy, that you threw them away there today. He said, they're not going to bother you from this day on. And brothers and sisters, boys and girls, they never bother me from that day on. And I believe tonight, whatever the day, whatever you have need of, if you surrender to Jesus Christ, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You say, well, Brother Billy, I don't understand. I can't understand it either, but I know it works. Right up here at Spider Ranch. We was up there on a hunting trip with these brothers here. You say, well, I, I know Brother Brent, but it was for you. It was for me. The gift wasn't for Brother Branham. It was for you and I. Right up here at Spider Ranch out here at Prescott, Arizona. We was up there with him one day. And I was all nervous like I told you last night. My system, my makeup. And I was going through a battle. And I was cooking a little bit. And making some steaks for the brothers here. And we was all eating. You remember Brother Ed? We was up there working like that. And Dad had on an old black hat with that red bandana around it like that. And I was cooking some steaks over the fire for these brothers. He was hunting up here. And I tried to eat, and every time I tried to eat, I just, I just couldn't. It just seemed like I couldn't swallow it. My nerves were so bad. And I'll never forget, like you asked me last night, did he ever always pray out loud? No, he didn't. He just took his little hat, and I see him just raise it and set it back down. One second, five seconds, I don't know, he just lifted it up and put it back down. When that hat come back down, a coolness come over my stomach. I knew he'd done prayed for me. I started eating. You remember, I ate everything in camp. I just ate that all night. He was sitting around the campfire talking about us that night and he, he started taking off his old boots. And when he did, he said, boys, he said, did you all see Billy? He said he was so nervous. He said he's got a lot of pressure on him. He said he was trying to eat his supper and he said he couldn't. And he said, all I'd done was just raise my hat and ask the Lord to help him. He said, you see what a big supper he ate? He said, one time, he said his stomach was completely tore up. He said he thought he was dying. He said, but God healed him. He took that old boot off his ankle was about this big. Remember, Jim? All purple and black. He said, I fell about two months ago. And he said, this angle, and he said, it just keeps getting worse. He said, I prayed every night for God to heal it. And he said, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. He said, the gift ain't for me. He said, it's for you. So the gift, children, wasn't far, Brother Brandon, but it was for you. There was a lady one time that Brother Brandon prayed for. Two of them. Brother Brandon said, go and believe and you'll be healed. One had a tumor, I'm sorry, a goiter, 
and one had a stomach trouble. There were several days after Brother Branham had left town. The woman got up one morning, she felt a little something down her stomach. She hadn't been healed, but she had the promise. She went in, she said, I think I can eat a little bit. And she began to eat. She said, ooh, that didn't hurt. She began to eat a little more and it didn't hurt. She ate a full breakfast. She got on the phone, she called her friend. She says, guess what? She said, you remember Brother Brandon prayed for us? I said, yeah. I said, you remember he told us we'd be well? Yeah. She said, it happened this morning. She said, I'm well. She said, praise God, I am too. She said, what do you mean? She said, you know my garter? She said, yeah. She said, I woke up this morning and shook the sheets and said, it's gone, I can't find it nowhere. The word had been spoken. And Brother Branham said, the angel passed through the land. I believe that the prayer that Brother Branham prayed for the young people here in Prescott, I believe that prayer is the same prayer that be answered today. And I believe the same God and the same angel is passing through today. And whatever we have need of, that we can have what we have need of. Do you believe that today? There was a little girl one time up in Canada, and I'm getting ready to close here. And when she did, my dad's brother, Donnie, he was, he, it was his brother. But yet he knew that was more than his brother. He stood in the prayer line one night. Here come a little girl. And kids, if I had time, I could tell you of healing after healing. Waterhead babies. They used to bring them in on pillows. Heads, I mean, I know they don't have those things nowadays. But the heads would be like this. You remember Brother Perry? they lay them on pillows. And I seen Brother Brandon pray for him. and say, take a string and lay around this child's head. And bring it back tomorrow night to see how much that head's gone down. There'd be that much strain that next night, that much strain the next night, that much strain, and before it was over the top, the child would be sitting there perfectly normal like that. That was to get your attention. Because there was a message to come forth. And this little girl, she walked up there. I'll never forget, she's had little old braces. She walked up like that. She had a little something under her arm like this. Daddy said, Hi, sweetheart. And if you ever knew him, he just, it's just a way about him. That's right. You read of Jesus in the Bible. You saw the same spirit live through a man that I called Dad. That's right. That you called Brother Brad. Right. The life of Jesus Christ was manifested upon the earth in a man called William Brown. Do you believe that? He loved him so much that he came and dwelt in him. And he's still the same God today. His little darling walked up to my dad. My dad's brother said he'd never forget that. He said she had this little box under her arm. She had these little braces and these crutches. And the only thing that'll kill you is to see a little child crippled or sick. He said, good evening, sweetheart. She said, hello. He said, what do you want? She said, I'm crippled, Mr. Brown. She said, I've never been able to walk in my life. She says, but I believe if you pray for me, I'll be healed. Daddy said, what you got there under your arm, sweetheart? She just clutched it real tight. She said, sir, she said, I've never walked in my life. She said, but inside this box, I've got a pair of shoes. She said, I had my mama to go buy me. She said, I believe that when you pray for me, I'm going to put on these shoes and I'm going to walk. What I was telling you in the beginning of my testimony, our approach, our attitude. My dad's brother said, he said, sweetheart, that's wonderful. He said, why don't you go over there and stand, get your little chair and sit down over there at the end of the prayer line. And he said, let your little faith build up for a little bit. Now listen to me, kids, real careful. Not, not to me, I don't mean that. We just, just listen to my closing testimony. He said, sit and listen and watch for a little bit. And let your faith build up. And he says, then Brother Brandon will pray for you. And I believe Jesus will heal you. My dad's brother, in his mind, he began to think, what a way for Bill to get out of that. 
He said, He knows that that little girl ain't going to walk. And he said, He don't want to pray for her out in front of all those people because he just wanted to get out and pray for that little girl. And he said, He began to think these things in his mind. He said, little girl took her little crutches and her little box and she walked over and sat down like he said in a chair. You might think that God ain't answered your prayer. He might have you sitting here through the first half, but you got your shoes on today. We're going to walk all over that devil. Mom and Dad, it's time for the angel to pass back through the lane. He said he sat there. He said he brought through several hundred people back in those days. He says when he did, my uncle said in his mind, he said, now that ain't something. He said, their bill has forgot all about that little girl. And said, the people's forgot about it. And said, that's how he's going to get out of it. And said, about that time that he turned, Donnie didn't say a word, he just thought it. He said, no, nah, no, nah, Donnie. He said, I ain't forgot her. And he says, neither has Jesus forgot her. He said, go get her and bring her here. <laughs> yes, sir. God ain't forgot about you today either. God ain't forgot about your prayer, mother. He said, here she come with them little crutches. He said, you come walking up there. He said, sweetheart. She said, yes, sir. He said, are you ready? She said, I'm ready. He said, do you, is your little faith got up right now? She said, yes, it has. Sir, are you ready to believe? She says, I'm ready. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, give me those crutches. Them little legs come out perfectly normal. She put them little shoes on and she walked on that platform. Boys and girls, it's time to get our shoes on and walk all over the devil. Do you believe that today? Let us bow our heads and Brother Patterson comes. Whatever we have need of, is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's sing that little song, He is Lord. I know you know that. Whatever you have need of today, He's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's sing it with our eyes shut unto Him all together. Yeah. 